If I could help somebody as I pass along, if I could share somebody with a word or song, if I could tell somebody the peace traveling wrong, then my living shall. Could help somebody as a pass along. If I could do my duty as a Christian heart, if I could bring back the beauty to a world so rough, if I can spread love, mercy as the master taught, then my living shall not. Be Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If I can help somebody as I pass along, as I trunk along this world, then my living shall not be in vain. If my life, if my word can help a dying soul, if my actions, if my activities here on earth can point the sorrowful, the downtrodden 
the hurting, then my living shall not be in vain. Let's go to God in prayer. Let's pour our hearts unto him. Let's ask the Lord to bring us back home to receive from his servant this evening. That our life will impact. That we will not only leave a mark of achievement in this world of certificates, of gold, of silver, of dollar. But we'll look back and see that there is somebody my life has affected. There is somebody my life has encouraged. Let's commit the word we're about to hear this evening. And let's pray that we'll leave a mark, that somebody will point to you, point to me, and say, is this person that encouraged me? Is this person that saved me? Is this person that pointed me to the right way? I was lost. I was gone. Media, the message from the pastor. The Lord bless you, and the Lord reign in your life in Jesus' name. Father, I well, thank you today for the Bible study. Thank you for your preserving power. Thank you for keeping us alive and healthy so that we can keep on living for you and bringing glory to you. We're asking, Lord, tonight, you open our eyes to see what you have preserved for us in the scriptures. And we pray, Lord, we will not hear in vain. We will not worship in vain. We will not study in vain. And we will not just believe in vain. We pray that the reality of the word, the expression of faith, and the evidence and the proof our salvation will be in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. Can see now we're coming to James chapter 2. And today we're looking at verses 14 to 19. It talks about faith. Now there are people that do not understand the book of James, the epistle of James to uh, the church. They think that there's a contradiction between Paul and James, that Paul spoke about faith without works, and that James talks about faith with works. And they think there's a kind of uh, contradiction that when you have faith, you don't have to do anything. There is no work, there is no fruit, there is no evidence. Just believe. You need to understand that James and Paul were talking, emphasizing different things. Number one, Paul was talking about the faith to enter into the kingdom of God. That whatever you've done in the past, whatever you've not done in the past, you have faith. And that faith, just repent, just turn around and face Jesus and be connected with Jesus, faith in Christ. Without works, make sure to enter the kingdom of God. Now, after entering the kingdom of God, we're talking now about the expression of your life, the love, the works, the evidence that you have entered in, the faith that Paul spoke about is the faith at the gate. 
you enter the gate so that you can walk in the narrow way. And the faith that James is talking about is now that you have entered the gate and you are walking in, in the narrow way. The faith that has evidence that you actually entered and now you are expressing your faith by the work, by the deeds, by the fruits you bear. And now there is another kind of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 tells us these all died in faith. Faith to enter, faith to express that you're a real child of God and faith as you exit, exit the world. And so you have the faith at the beginning, you have the faith that continues, and you have the faith at the exit of the world. Faith, beginning, faith in continuing, and faith in ending well. Because only they that endure unto the end shall be saved. And so there's no contradiction. We're not talking about the evidential proof of salvation, saving faith in Christ. In James chapter 2, reading from verse 14, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he has faith, watch of mouth. Just, I have faith, I have faith, and have not words have not the evidence can that faith save him look at verse 15 in verse 15 if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food verse 16 and one of you say unto them depart in peace be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding, ye give them not those things which are needful to the body. What does that profit? In verse 17 it says, even so, faith, if it has not works, if it has no fruit, if it has no evidence, if you are not walking in by that faith, expressing your faith in a definite, practical, profitable way, it says that faith is dead, being alone. Dead, being alone. Then in verse 18, verse 18 tells us, yea, yes, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Verse 19, in verse 19, thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well, but look at this, the devils also believe and tremble. The devils also believe that the day of judgment is coming and they tremble. The devils also believe that a day of reckoning is coming and they tremble. The devil also believe the nature of God, that God is holy, that God is just, and that God is impartial, and the devils tremble. But if you say you have faith, you do not tremble at the law you are broken. You do not tremble at the evil life you live. You do not tremble at the emptiness of your life. The devils are even better than you are. And God, who is a just God, cannot condemn those devils and then make you go free. We're talking about faith that has proof. Faith that has expression, faith that has evidence of that salvation that we have in Christ. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, we're looking at the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit. The deadness of empty faith. I believe, I believe, I believe 
where is the fruit? Where is the evidence, the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit? Number two, the deceptiveness. You deceive yourself. You deceive the preachers. You deceive the community. You deceive everyone, but the one that is more serious is yourself. You deceive yourself that you are going to heaven, whereas you're on the broad way that goes, that leads to hell. The deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. Fruit, external fruit, without essential faith. You have not been planted in the kingdom by faith. It's just like, you know, like those seeds we learned in biology that, you know, the wind just scatters them and they begin to bear some kind of fruit, but there's no root. And there are people like that. They do not have essential faith that plants us in the kingdom of God. They deceive themselves by those external fruit, the deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. Number three, is the demand is demand of explicit faith with the expected fruit. We're coming to number one. Number one, we're looking at the deadness of empty faith without evident fruit. Three things we're looking at there. Number one, there's no saving faith without spiritual fruit. No saving faith without spiritual fruit. Anybody can give any testimony. Anybody can shout and say, I have faith, but it is not saving faith if it does not have spiritual fruit. Number two, no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. Sanctification is not a word of mouth. Sanctification is not a doctrine in the book. There are churches like ours that have sanctification in their tenets of faith. They have it in the book. They have it in their song. Holiness unto the Lord. Shout it loud and long. It's in the book. But... It must come to the heart. There's no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. Number three, no steadfast faith without steady fruit. Steady fruit. The fruit that abides and the fruit that is there all the time. Knock the man. The fruit of salvation will be evident. Push the man, the fruit of salvation will be evident. Make him to, you know, put your leg and make him to stumble, but the evidence of salvation will be there. Slap him on the one cheek, the evidence of salvation will be there. Compel him to go, the, the first smile, the evidence of salvation will be there. Take something from him, his clothes, his honor, and his self-esteem. Take anything from him, the evidence of salvation will be there. Interact with him. And you will see the evidence of salvation. If there is no steadfast faith, then there's no steady fruit. If there's no steady fruit, then there is no steadfast faith. We're looking at number one. Number one, we're looking at no saving faith without spiritual fruit. It tells us in Titus chapter 1, verse 16, it says, they profess that they know God, but in words they deny Him. You can see contradiction in their lives. They profess that they believe in God. They profess that they know God. They profess they are children of God, but in words they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate 
they profess that they know God. They're religious, traditionally religious. They're religious, they're denominationally religious, and they are active religiously, but in words, they deny him. Their lives contradict the faith they profess. No saving faith without spiritual fruit. It tells us in John chapter 2, John chapter 2, reading from verse 23, now, when he, Christ, was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed on his name. They said they believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them. Jesus, the one that knows every heart, every life, and the one that knows the root of the expressions of our lives, the one that knows the reason behind every action, he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men, verse 25, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. The depravity was still in them, and they said, I believe, I believe. The deception was still in them, I believe, I believe. And the defilement was still in their lives, in their private. And yet they said, I believe, I believe. And Jesus said, he will not commit himself unto them because they did not have the spiritual fruit to back up what he claimed a saving faith. Uh, we're looking at number two now. Number two, we're looking at no sanctifying faith without scriptural fruit. No sanctifying faith, it takes faith to be sanctified. And there are people that profess sanctification, I am sanctified. I am sanctified because they have some external resemblance to the people, to the saints of God who are really sanctified. I am sanctified. Wait until something happens that does not please them and they flare up with anger. I thought, my friend, you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I easily get annoyed. There's no sanctification there. Wait until something rubs them the other way, the other direction. There's something they don't like. And then they come out, and you will see they have an attitude of fighting, an attitude of wanting to, you know, blow you down and kick you up. I thought you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I easily get annoyed. There's no sanctification there. And wait until something is being divided between him and her. And he wants to take the lion's share. And then his struggle begins. I thought you said you were sanctified. Yes, but I don't like anybody cheating me. Sanctification must have a scriptural fruit. It tells us in Acts chapter 26, reading from verse 18, Acts 26, verse 18, to open their eyes. If I'm sanctified, my eyes will be open, spiritual eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light. Your life will be in the light. There will be nothing covered. There will be nothing secret. Everything will be open because you have been turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. When we are saved and when we are sanctified, our lives are free from the control of Satan. My friend, I've been watching you. Once something annoys you, I can tell. Oh, you see, you, I understand what you are telling me. But you know, it's not me. It's the devil. If you are saved, the devil will not be in control of your life. 
If you are sanctified, the devil will not be in control of your temper. Because sanctification, the sanctification that comes from God and we receive by faith, clears all doses away and we're turned from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins, that salvation and inheritance among them which are sanctified, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me, that is in Christ. It tells us in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 20. It says, I am crucified with Christ. That, that's the evidence, the evidence that we know God, the evidence that we're attached to God, the evidence that we're, we are identified with Christ. I the me on the inside the old man in me the one that is they get angry the one that is easily annoyed the one that looks like the world and the one that gives a kiss it like adam it says the i within me i am crucified tell me you're sanctified How about the adamic nation has that been crucified Tell me you are sanctified. I avouch that man on the inside that's always, always thinking of evil, always imagining evil, always dreaming of evil. Tell me, if you are sanctified, I, the one within, is crucified. The one that secretly likes pornography and is, uh, you know, turn, and you know it's bad. How do I know you know? When somebody you respect, who is not like you, who doesn't like pornography like you do, when it's coming, you close it up. Where is the crucifixion? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You are conscious of all that, everything, the price he paid, the sacrifice he made, and the blood he shed for your salvation, for your sanctification, and you are forever grateful. In attitude, you are grateful. In action, you are grateful. Anything you do, you are grateful, and you are always remembering he died for me. He gave himself for me. How grateful I am that he did all that for me and that affects your life. You think before you act. How will they show gratitude to the Lord? How will they show that I have that saving faith, that sanctifying of faith? It tells us in Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading here from verse 12, Hebrews 13, verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered without the gate, outside the gate. Verse 13, in verse 13, let us go forth therefore unto him without the calm, bearing his reproach. What does that mean? I know that the Lord wants me to go through this path in this direction. And I know also that in that path, the Lord wants me to go through, there is reproach. There is the believing of good people, righteous people, holy people. I know in that path, the Lord wants me to go through, there is a kind of be belittling and looking down reproach because you are a saved sanctified soul if you are sanctified you will go through it because it says let us go forth therefore unto him bearing his reproach but if you are always running from I don't like their attitude 
I don't like what they do. I don't like what I might go through. I might come to some reproach. I might come to some. You know, they, they'll push me down. And they'll push me away. And even though I know that the past that Lord wants me to go through, I don't want to do that because of the reproach. There's no sanctification there. When there's sanctification, you identify with Christ in persecution, in reproach, in everything. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. In verse 14, it says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The people who are only for the world, only for the earth, they are running away from the challenges of life. They cannot come out and express the goodness and the grace of God, the salvation, the sanctification of the Lord. They're only thinking about the, about the people who know that here we don't have any continuing city and we're seeking one to come, the free. They come out. They do what the Lord wants them to do, reproach or no reproach, insult or assault, whatever, because that depravity within has been taken away. And whatever they meet, the reproach and the insult and the assault, there's no anger and there is uh, no fighting because they know whose nature they now have. We're looking at number three here. Number three, no steadfast faith without steady fruit. If you cannot bear fruit steadily, if, you on, if you're only on the mountain top, when everybody is praising you and appreciating you, and then when they look away from you because they cannot be looking at you all the time, they have their own lives to live. And they have, they have their own journey to traverse. And they have their own goal to pursue. And once they're not looking at you and you're not at the limelight, then you do not have the fruit you used to have. When we have steadfast faith, when we have the faith that will take us to the end of our journey, and we're steadfast about that, there will be steady fruit, steady fruit all along. It tells us in First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 9. In verse 9 it says, A whom resisted fast in the faith, the devil will come, trials will come, temptation will come, difficulties, challenges will come. But you stand and you are steadfast in the faith, knowing that... The same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. We stand steadfast. That's faith. That's faith. It's not just I believe, I believe. Yes, you believe at the entrance of the kingdom. And then you're moving on. As you're moving on, you have to have that steadfast faith. You are climbing the hill. The heel may be tall. The heel may almost get you out of breath because of the slope. But you are steadfast. One step more. One day more. One activity more. One victory more. Steadfast. Steadfast. All that longer moving in the Lord. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And we're reading here from verse 14. It says, For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. That's not talking about the faith by which you enter. You're not walking on the narrow way, on the highway of holiness. And you're walking in a steadfast way. You're moving on, and you're not diverted here, diverted there. You don't take another by road where things might be easier. But it says we're made partakers of Christ. If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast 
until the end that nothing shifts you but the people that do not have the steadfast faith have you seen them they came out of egypt hilarious happy and joyful they came out with many things that were given to them by those egyptians how happy they were and then they went through the red sea and when they went through the red sea and they saw the egyptians floating on the sea they shouted glorious is god holy is our god how happy they were but when there was a little thirst and the water was bitter and they couldn't drink they started murmuring you can tell they didn't have steadfast faith in the lord they walked by sight what are we going to drink what are we going to eat how is this going to happen how is that going to happen they didn't have steadfast faith you see them happy and joyful when they come to know the lord they have the faith to enter but now the faith to express their happiness and joy in god and they continue the narrow way there's no husband yet and then their faith will begin to shake there's no wife yet their faith will begin to shake and there is no child after marriage their faith will begin to shake but you know abraham was told that he was steadfast in faith even though his body was telling him how could you have a child now but he knew he was fully persuaded that what God has promised is able to do that the steadfast faith. The Lord wants us to be steadfast. So we're not undulating, we're not vacillating, we're not up and down, down and up. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 18. Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 18. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest they came out came into the kingdom but now during in the way the faith that makes us to stand and stay in the way they didn't have that and so they could not enter into his rest but to them that believed not they believed at the beginning but the faith did not continue in verse 19 in verse 19 so we'll see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter in because of unbelief. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away by the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness watch it watch it all the time whatever the people do do not fall from your own steadfastness whatever the people accept or reject do not fall from your own steadfastness whatever other people declare or demonstrate that's them that's them do not fall from your own steadfastness whatever lies anybody may preach whatever life anyone may live that's them make sure that you remember how you came into the kingdom by faith personal faith in the lord you didn't believe like in like with corporate faith you didn't believe like with family faith personal faith you came into the kingdom there were people that had the same message you heard at the time you believed the same message but they did not believe they did not end time you made your choice and you said i am going to enter into the kingdom i repent and i believe and that's that's how you enter now the error of the wicked some backslide some scorn some scoff 
whatever they do, do not allow the wickedness of the people, anyone, to make you fall from your own steadfastness. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, but grow in grace. Do you know we grow in grace? Do you know we grow in faith? Do you know we grow in love? Do you know we grow in consecration? Do you know we grow even in our steadfastness? Do you know we grow in our absolute surrender unto the Lord? Grow. Because if you don't grow, you will retrogress. You'll go back. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever, both now and forever, in your life now, in your life forever, amen. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, the deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. We're looking at James chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, faith, if it has not works, if it has no expression, if it has no fruit, is dead being alone. That's dead faith that does not have fruit, that does not have expression, that does not have accompanying work. That's why we talk about the deceptiveness of external fruit without essential faith. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. There are people that choose whatever they want. Okay, there's faith. I choose faith. There's works. You choose works. Okay, there is holiness. You choose holiness. There is liberty. I choose liberty. There are people that divide the provisions of the word of God. And whatever their flesh cannot endure. I don't choose that. Whatever will build up their flesh, accept their lust, accept their weakness, accept and pamper them, pitch them, and always encourage them, even when they are sinning. That's what they want. I like encouragement. I choose encouragement choose the whole word of God. Everything he has given us. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God shall man live. Thou hast faith, I have work. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. We're looking at three things here. Number one, number one, we're looking at the superficial fruit on the surface appears like fruit. You know, sometimes you see uh, some of these uh, wax uh, fruit, like pineapple, and it looks like real, but it's superficial. A bite will disappoint you. There are people that have the fruits like that. Looks like fruit, but when they open their mouth to talk, you can see it's superficial. They don't have the real fruit. And when they, you know, when something comes across them, then you can see it's wax. It's superficial. It's not real. There is superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. Number two is the spectacular fruit without the fruit of the Spirit. Spectacular fruit, that is, they can work miracles. They can cast out 
devils in the name of Jesus. The, the devil doesn't know they're alive. The devil just hears the name of Jesus and the devil flees for their life. They do not have the fruit of the spirit. Number three is simulated fruit without the foundation of the surrender, the urge to manifest. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. It tells us in Hosea chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hosea chapter 10, verse 1. Israel is an empty vine. Empty vine. Empty bag that cannot stand upright because it's empty. There's nothing inside. Empty life that cannot do right because it's empty empty of the grace of god empty of the love of god empty of devotion unto god israel is an empty vine he bringeth forth fruit unto himself he bringeth forth fruit unto himself do you know people like that whatever they think they're doing and they say they are doing it for God, really they are doing it for themselves. They are doing it for people to appreciate them. They are doing it for people to see their gifts. And uh, if you don't uh, give appreciation to that gift, then they misuse the gift. They distort the gift because you are not giving them the honor, the glory they want. The fruit is unto themselves. But you know, when we're bearing fruit unto God, it doesn't matter what people think, what people say, what people do. We give that gift unto the Lord with everything we have got. We we'll say, the Lord will like this. The Lord will appreciate this. Our mind is on God, not on ourselves. A mind is on God, not on people that can either praise us or blame us. But Israel, Israel is an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself according to the multitude of his fruit. He has increased the altars according to the goodness of his land. They have made goodly images. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, Now their heart is divided. Their heart is divided. They are not staying on God. They are not focusing on God. They are not relying on God. They are not walking. They are not living for the glory of God alone. They're looking for another thing. It says their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. When your heart is divided, when you are not totally leaning on the Lord, when you are not totally serving the Lord, but you have another thing in focus. It says you will be found faulty. It shall break down their altars. He shall spoil their images. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, now it says, So to yourselves in righteousness. If you're going to serve the Lord, if you're going to be steadfast with the Lord, if you're not going to remain superficial, so to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteousness upon you. And look at Matthew chapter 23. The people that have superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. It's not faith in the Savior producing what they're doing. It's self-effort. It's commitment to religion. His commitment to the things that the same people will appreciate. And he'll go any lane to have the praise of men. Superficial fruit 
without faith in the Savior. Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay the tithe of mint and anise, and come in, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The weightier matters of the law, that one they omitted justice or judgment, mercy, faith. These ought ye to have done. That he is giving of tithes, ye should have done that. That's all right. But you shouldn't have left the other undone. Everything you do in action, in life, in expression of what you believe must be coming from the heart of faith. Look at verse 25. In verse 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup meticulous the outside of the club of the cup what people will see what people will know they're meticulous in keeping that right in keeping that clean and it says you do that for the platter but within they are full of extortion and excess okay they know people will not see this their hearts have not been cleansed their hearts have not been emptied of evil things, of defilement. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. Righteous unto men. That is, unto men who are not living with them. The people who are living with them, they can tell. They can tell of the temper. They can tell of the anger. They can tell of evil action. Those who are living with them. But those who don't know them, they appear righteous unto men. Uh, the people who look at only the outward expression. Thank you, sir. If that's only what you're looking at. Thank you, madam. And then you bend. If that's all you're looking for, and you don't know the heart, they appear righteous outwardly unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Of hypocrisy and iniquity. Why don't you check up your heart? Check up on your life. We have had enough. We know about salvation, and we know if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. How new are you? The new creature in the new covenant. We know that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Do you ever think of entering the kingdom of God? Or do you just act like a Pharisee? Or do you just live like a Pharisee? When last did you ask for grace to do what you need to do beyond your human strength? When last did you pray that God will give you the power to subdue the flesh and subdue the depravity that is trying to raise his ugly head from your life. Are you not just satisfied with the outward dressing, outward appearance, outward uh, similarity to the saints of God? Is that enough? That superficial fruit without faith in the Savior. And we're looking at Isaiah chapter 58. And we're reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. And show my people 
their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin look at verse 2 in verse 2 yet they seek me daily you know the people that go to church daily there are you know the people that go to prayer meeting daily in their church there are do you know the people that study the Bible every day I mean in the church congregation there are and yet it says they seek me daily and delight to know my ways they like to have the word preach unto them they delight to know my ways and it says as a nation that did righteousness as if they did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God they ask of me the ordinance of justice they take the lights in approaching to God are they righteous because of that no if you read the following verses it shows that they did not really know God. They didn't delight in the word that will make them turn, make them repent, make them seek the Lord. They were superficial worshippers. They didn't have faith, real faith in God. In Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. It says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee you know these are people the angels of the church in ephesus the members of the church the minister of the church in ephesus they loved doctrine and they are very vigilant on doctrine if anybody comes and does not bring that doctrine they can spot it out immediately and you can say that's false doctrine, that's wrong doctrine, that's not scriptural doctrine. We're honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. That's good, but nevertheless, I have somewhat against them. Because thou hast led thy first love. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, it says, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. The one that has dropped the first love is falling. The one that has dropped the original consecration is falling. The one that is not looking at circumstances before they can manifest their love to Christ is falling. The one that is, you know, when he's not happy is not holy. Their happiness must come first. If there's no happiness, there's no holiness, they are not holy unto the Lord because after all, I'm not happy. Why should I be holy? Those people, they blend their false consecration and their false commitment. And it says, remember where thou hast fallen. And then it says, repent and do the false works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent you know we've heard of that repentance a lot yet we'll put the repentance in a pigeon hole those who are adulterers they must repent those who tell lies they must repent and those who are not in our church, they're coming for the first time. And they don't dress like we recommend. They must repent. About the people that lost their first love. Their first sensitivity to the voice of the Spirit. How about them? Are they not going to repent? How about the people that are just offering superficial sacrifice and they do not have deep deepening faith in Christ. Are they not to repent? Yes, they have to repent. Otherwise, they will come and take the candlestick. I will look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the spectacular fruits without 
the fruit of the Spirit. Would you know the people that have spectacular fruits and, and they know and they, they rejoice in that. They think that is the end of the road. They have spectacular, spectacular fruit. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Reading from verse 21, Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The people that feel calling Christ, Lord, Lord, that's sufficient. They never even make an effort to do the will of the Father who is in heaven. What the will of the Father? Our salvation, our redemption, our righteousness, our sanctification, our purity of heart, our life without reproach, our life free of offense toward God and toward man. That's the will of God. The people that never think about the will of God, all they think about is miracle, healing, deliverance. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. They're running after signs and wonders. And even when the opportunity is there to be saved, to examine our lives, whether we be in the face or not, that one, there's no concern for that. The concern they have is for prophecy, is for mighty works, it's for casting out devils. Verse 23. In verse 23, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Doing mighty works, I never knew you. They did not have the fruit that showed that the Holy Spirit is present in their lives. Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Where should your priority be? Your priority should be on having the fruit of the Spirit. Christ is coming, and he may come soon, anytime from now. And if all you have is that I got a miracle. Not only that, I give miracles to other people. I fast. I pray. I have the gifts of the Spirit. I have the word of knowledge. I have the word of wisdom. And I have faith to move mountains. But your heart does not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. At the end, you'll be of all men the most miserable. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, reading from verse 1, Though I speak of the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass, and a tinkling symbol. Verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, the love that walks by faith. I am nothing. Look at verse 3. It says in verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to preach the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, you know, there are people that are fanatical. 
And if there is any argument about your church and our church, you can fight. You can say, our pastor is the best in the land. No! We have a pastor you have not heard. A pastor is greater, better, and deeper than your deeper pastor. Then they remove their coat and are ready to fight. What are they fighting about? They're fighting about opinions. They're fighting about what he says against our people and what he's saying about his people. If you give your body to be burned and you are ready to defend your ideology, you are ready to defend your religion, you are ready to defend anything that you appreciate, that other people don't appreciate, if you die in that anger, in that annoyance, you die in that hot, furious temper, there's no heaven there. You see, what's important is the fruit of the Spirit will to have the love and the joy and the peace and the gentleness and the meekness and the long-suffering and the fidelity, the faith, and the steadfast and the temperance, the self-control. That's, that's what we need, and that is what shows that we belong to the Lord, but fighting about this and fighting about that and about this other thing, it says will miss the kingdom of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24, and I'm reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, and it says, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Don't be deceived. In these last days, there will arise prophets, false prophets, and false Christ that will show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. In verse 25, it says, Behold, I have told you before. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 9, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. The signs that deceive, the wonders that deceive, the miracles that deceive, lying wonders. In verse 10, in verse 10 it says, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. They received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. All they are looking for is the sensational that will make them feel excited. Look at that miracle. Look at that miracle. But they do not have the love for the truth that they might be saved. Look at yourself. Have you shifted your ground? Have you shifted from having salvation to having just signs and wonders and miracles? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. There are people, millions of them in the world, once they see miracle, they don't examine the doctrine the people preach. Once they see healing, deliverance, and once they see some sensational things, that man can pray. And once he prays, look at what happens. They do not look at the false doctrine beneath that miracle. And it says, because of that, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. In verse 12, verse 12 says that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in righteousness. We're looking at number three here. Number three, the simulated 
fruit without the foundation of surrender. If we're going to be acceptable to the Lord, there must be absolute surrender unto Him. You will have all or nothing. If you're bargaining, God, I give part of my heart and part of my love and part of my devotion unto you. I have another entity. I have another deity that I want to give the other part of my love, the other part of my consecration, the other part of my devotion. It says he will not share his glory with any other deity, with any other man. He will not share the submission you have with any other. He will not even share it with you. If you want to keep part of the surrender, part of the submission, part of the consecration, part of your love for yourself, it's not going to accept your self-love for the love of God. Simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender. And we're looking at Luke chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 13. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. It says, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and they will despise the other ye cannot serve god and mammon we must make a choice if we're going to love god love him with all your heart or your soul or your mind all your strength he wants total absolute surrender and he wants that before any other thing you offer unto him what if the wife in the home will say my husband this is just who i am i'll cook your food i'll take care of the house i'll be a great a good homemaker only one thing i cannot give you I cannot submit or surrender unto that one I hold. And nothing can take that away from me. Yes, I know I'm married, but surrender, submission, never. But I cook your food, I wash your clothes, I do everything, only that. What kind of marriage will that be? That kind of wife will make you a puppet that she can trample upon you and go anywhere because there's no surrender. The same thing, that's the way people are treating God. They say, God, I read your book, I read the Bible, I'll serve you, I'll worship, I'll do everything, but my worship will be devoid of surrender and submission. What do you think God thinks about that? He doesn't want those simulated fruits without absolute surrender unto him. That's why he says no man can serve God and mammon. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, and the Pharisees also, who are covetous, heard all these things. And they derided him. He preached well. They derided him. He preached the truth. They derided him. He spoke words of life eternal. They derided him. They looked down on him. They disrespected him. Why? He was telling the truth. For the truth came to near their door and because the truth came so much near them that's why they derided them and in verse 15 verse 15 says and he said unto them you know it's good to have christ as a model as an example 
as a perfect pattern that he will not shrink back because they derided him. His mouth will not be muscled because they derided him. He will not stop telling the truth, the burning truth in the hearts of men because they derided him. And so he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And that's what we need to understand, that uh, if we're serving the Lord, and there's no pretense, there's no cover-up, there's no superficiality. And we're looking at uh, Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 3. Romans chapter 10, we're reading from verse 3. It says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not have not have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God simulated fruit without the foundation of surrender we're coming to point number three point number three we're looking at the demand for explicit, very clear, or shaded, unclouded faith with expected fruit. The demand of God, the expectation of God, the thing that God is looking for in every heart, every heart that comes to him, that's the demand of explicit faith by faith Abraham when he was called to leave the awe of the Chaldeans he led going after what God had said not knowing whither he went faith in action by faith Noah when he was told to build an ark he moved with fear and faith so that he built the ark for the safety of his family and the people that were here. By faith, Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he walked with God. These were people that had explicit faith clear faith that you could see and you can tell here in the faith of the true believer and that's what god demands he doesn't want a kind of doubtful faith is that faith or something similar to faith it's a kind of a superficial faith that has no action that has no demonstration that this is total, complete, absolute faith unto God. The demand for explicit faith with the expected fruit. In James chapter 2, we're reading from verse 18. James chapter 2, reading from verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. And I will show thee my faith by my works. In verse 19, verse 19, thou believest that there is one God that doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. What's the apostle uh, James telling us here? He said, when you see the judgment of God, when you hear of the judgment of God, when you hear that God is a consuming fire, do you tremble? Do you stop what you are doing? Do you turn around? Do you repent? Do you go to God with a sober heart? 
He said, if you don't, will the devils tremble when they hear of the coming judgment and when Christ comes and he wants to drive out the legion. They are so afraid, they tremble. They say, don't cast us into the abyss. And then they said, there are swine there, cast us there. And they said, go. You see, they tremble because they know the judgment to come. Do you tremble when you hear of the judgment to come? The axe is laid on the root of the tree. And everyone that comes to God and believes in God must repent and turn away from evil. And we're looking at three things here. Number one, examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Examine your faith in the light of, look at Abraham, Hebrews chapter 11. Look at Abel. Look at Enoch. Look at Noah. Look at Moses. Look at the Jericho walls, how they fell. Look at the expression of faith and examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. Number two, evaluate your faith. Are you weak and found wanting? Is your faith going to make you ready for the coming of the Lord? Why are you coming to study the word of God and never evaluate what you have? Whether what you have is enough to enter into the kingdom or not. Evaluate your faith in line with noticeable trembling. Number three, express your faith with a life of noble truthfulness. Look at number one. Number one, examine your faith in the light of the New Testament. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith examine yourself so you just hear the word of god right so let us pray you stand there and you are waiting for in the in jesus name we pray have you prayed have you examined yourself have you thought of everything you have heard and compared with what you possess what you have are you just there you hear sound but did you understand the meaning of the sound as it reflects on your life? Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates. He wants us to examine our lives. He wants us to examine if Christ shall come today. Am I ready for the calling of the saints of above? We're well, looking at number two here. Number two, evaluate your faith in line with noticeable trembling. Evaluate that faith. Evaluate that faith. And we're coming to Psalm 2. And we're reading from verse 11. In Psalm 2, verse 11, serve the Lord of fear and rejoice with trembling. And rejoice with trembling. This is the inspired word of God. Do you ever tremble? anything will reach do you pass it on to others that's talking about the pharisees that's talking about the sadducees that's talking about the disciples before the cross that's talking about leaders and preachers and you put everything in different pigeonholes and you never put anything in your pigeonhole 
where will you spend eternity? Serve that Lord, what fear? What kind of fear? Should I all do all this? Running up, running down, sweating, climbing, descending, and yet, what if I'm not acceptable to God in the final day? What if my secret deeds are so serious and blamable in the sight of God and all these outward activities are not going to recommend me to God? That's what he's saying. Rejoice with trembling. Verse 12. In verse 12, it says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. For blessed are all they that put their trust in him. They trust him for salvation and they have real genuine salvation. They trust God for sanctification and they have real purging, purifying of their heart and life. They trust God for steady faith, steadfast faith, and the Lord keeps them up, kept by the power of the Lord unto that final salvation that shall be revealed. They trust God that the grace of God will be sufficient for them in trial, in tribulation, in persecution, in misunderstanding, in suffering. They trust God that nothing will stop them on this or what journey to heaven. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, we're looking at verse 12. It says, Wherefore, my beloved, my brethren, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, walk out your own salvation, this Paul the Apostle, by the Spirit of God, it's not even James now, but they tell us that, you know, Paul understood faith. Faith without works. I told you already, it's the faith to enter. But now that you are in the way, in the narrow way that leads to heaven, walk out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Then in verse 13, in verse 13, for it is God which walketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Verse 14, do all things without murmurings. Those are the people that have faith. They know that what they are called to do is by God. They know that the work they are doing, that the work of God, and they know it's not man. And whatever man feels about what they do, or doesn't feel about what they do, that's not a concern to them. They know because I am called of God, and because God is watching over everything I do, I must do all things without murmurings and disputing. Can I tell you something? Whatever you cannot do without murmuring, don't do it. People might search for you and look for you. Where are you? Where are you? We'll be waiting for you. If you cannot do it without murmuring, don't do it. It brings condemnation. It brings judgment. It brings the heavy vengeance of God. When you're doing it and doing it, but you're murmuring and complaining and disputing whatever you cannot do without, you know, fighting with somebody, without knocking somebody, without murmuring, disputing, just don't do it, just give it up. Because if we're going to be appreciated by God, recognized by God, must do all things without murmurings and disputings. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says that ye may be blameless 
and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom he shine as light in the world. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, holding forth the word of life. Don't murmur. Don't grumble. You're a preacher. This is happening. That is happening. Don't preach then. If you have to murmur, because you're wasting your time. If you have to complain, if you have to grumble, if you have to dispute, if you have to fight in preaching, don't preach. Don't allow any murmuring, any complaining, and any disputing, and any debate, and any complaining. Hold 